week we of course concluded in our second part of Genesis chapter number 19. The first week, the first part being that of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course part B or the second week which was last week we went over the consequences of Sodom and Gomorrah. And specifically the majority of the time we focus on the consequences that came to the Christian. Not necessarily just the consequences of Sodom and Gomorrah itself being destroyed but the consequences that came to the Christians that were involved with Sodom and the city Gomorrah. Of course, Lot, that would be in his family, his life. So we're going to begin here in Genesis chapter number 20. Look down with me, Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 1. The Bible reads, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Now, I like to point out where locations are many times and a way a trick. Let me give you a Bible trick real quick to help you memorize things. So a lot of different areas are mentioned all throughout the Bible, right? And you may not or you may or may not have put together the fact that there's a span, of course, hundreds of years and you have Noah living on the earth, you have Adam living on the earth, you have big gaps between all these people, David living on the earth, Jesus living on the earth. But over and over again, you see the same places referenced. And it can be hard because everything changes. Different things are being focused on, different backdrop as far as the story that's being told. So it can be hard to picture the, ge the, the geographical region where they're living because it's kind of changing. Nations are changing, right? But I'll tell you one thing that I do to help me remember where these cities are that are referenced all throughout the Bible is what I do is I remember something very prominent that took place, a story that's very famous. And then every time, I'll remember that story, you know, I'll memorize this, of course, over a couple of days. I'll think about that story, and I'll think about that land or that city where this particular act or event took place. And then you'll notice every time when you read the Bible, you'll start, every time you see that, you'll start seeing these locations that are mentioned. Now, let me give you an example. Here in verse number two, or verse number one, we read at the end, it says that he dwelled between Kadesh and Shur. Now, Kadesh is the same location as the waters of Meribah. Does anyone remember where the waters of Meribah are? Yeah, the waters of Meribah is where uh, Moses ended up uh, you know, uh, uh, striking the rock and the water came out. This is the wilderness of Zen, and it, or it's the desert of Zen, and the wilderness of Paran. It's the same thing. And the way I remember those, all three of those things is obviously, and this is just like I said, it's a memory trick. It's Bible study, obviously. So these things are good so you can understand your Bible. So in the Bible, you know, the word wilderness today doesn't necessarily normally speak of something being a desert, does it? That's not really how we use the word wilderness. But when you read your Bible, you'll realize that the word wilderness is describing a desert. It means desert. So when you, when you read with the children of Israel traveling to the land of Canaan, it talks about them being in, at, at Kadesh. And sometimes it says that they're in the wilderness of Zin. And then sometimes it'll say, or the desert of Zin. And sometimes it'll say the wilderness of Paran. Well, those are the exact same things. It's the exact same location. That's, that's all that is. And one thing that I use as a memory trick is that there are wa there's waters located in that area. Isn't that kind of different? A desert or a wilderness has waters. Well, everybody remembers the story. This is the overall point. Everybody remembers the story where he strikes the rock, right? Water gushes out. Isn't that a pretty well-known event? I mean, it's cited in the New Testament when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. Well, that is actually the exact same location right now that, that Abraham is traveling to. So sometimes you don't realize that, but Abraham is stepping foot and is going and he's dwelling in the exact same location where the nation of Israel will one day go in the wilderness of Zen, you know, the desert of Zen, the wilderness of Paran, where the waters of Meribah are located. He's living there, but years, years, you know, you know, many years later, 400 years later, or however many years it is later, many generations later, they're going to end up much more than 400 because they're in Egypt for 400. But they're, they're brought out, and they go to the exact same location where Abraham lived. Isn't that pretty interesting? The same place where he lived. You, know, you see all these things happening in the mountain of Hebron. So these things may not seem important to you, but they should be. You need to know where these locations are because it becomes relevant. And you can know. You can tie things together as far as events occurring with Abraham, events occurring with David many years later, like the mountain of Hebron. You know, and then many, many things happening after that. So pay attention to locations. It's extremely important in the Bible. It means a lot. You can learn from it. 
So, and it says that they sojourned in Gerar. Now, that's a nation at that time, Gerar. Look at verse number two. It says, And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech, Abimelech I'm sorry, in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, does this story sound familiar? Abraham obviously doesn't learn from his mistakes. Go back to Genesis chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number 13. Because this almost identical story took place one other time with Pharaoh in Egypt. So look at Genesis chapter number 13. And I want you to look at verse number 10. Actually, it's 12, sorry. Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 10. Genesis 12, 10, it says this. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, and Sarah, of course, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And we know, of course, the outcome of what took place there. But notice the parallel of these two. You go back to Genesis chapter number 20. These two uh, stories, they're almost identical. This actually happens one other time, again, with Isaac. This takes place with Isaac, and it takes place with Abimelech as well. And then some people have theorized that this may be the second Abimelech. You know, you, know, you have Pharaoh, and he'll have Pharaoh Nico, and then Pharaoh another, you know, they'll have another name. It's like the name of Caesar. It basically means king. Well, a lot of people have said, well, maybe Abimelech means king, and it could have been many years later. So, of course, there's an age gap between Abraham and uh, Isaac. Now, another thing to notice is that this takes place immediately after Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. And if not, you know, like he made this decision because of Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, it's within a couple of months. And the way you can tell that is if you look in Genesis 21, Genesis chapter number 21, it says in verse 1, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did it to Sarah as he had spoken. So, notice that happens immediately after, of course, chapter number 20, right? Well, we're told in Genesis 18 and chapter 17, Genesis 17 and 18, that it was going to be one year until Isaac was born. So that tells you, as far as the timeline, that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, and after that took place, within whatever period of time was left, which maybe eight months, seven months, whatever, Abraham went down to, uh, in this case, Gerar, Kadesh, and Shur, well, between that location, and all of these events uh, transpired at that time. So timelines are important as well. Make sure we know where we're at on the timeline. So it says there in verse number 3 one more time, But God came to Abimelech in a dream. We see this happening very often where God will come and speak to someone in a dream. And it says, By night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, I also want to point out something here. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter number 20, Verse number 10. Notice what the consequence of his actions were going to be. He said to him, Behold, thou art a dead man. What's he saying? I'm going to kill you, isn't he? Okay, what is the act? What would we refer to the act that Abimelech would have uh, committed if he would have gone forward with his plans here? What would it be? Adultery. Adultery, right. So people will argue, well, you know, and I've mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, people will argue... That about the, the punishments that should be implemented today. And they'll, they'll argue and say, you know, that, uh, and they'll argue against Bible believers and people that believe the Bible that will say specifically that the law of the Lord should be also implemented today because it's perfect, right? And that's what we believe, of course. All the laws and all the judgments of the Lord are perfect. That is the just judgment for all of eternity. I mean, that's God's law. God's law does not change. It's always perfect. Amen. So if you committed, you know, murder under the Levitical law while the priest and the temple were here on earth, you know, it's crazy to me that a person would say, yes, they deserve to be killed then. That was the punishment.
punishment that they deserve then, but now it's different. It's like justice doesn't change, my friend. It's right. always the same. That's ridiculous. Amen. So whatever the punishments were for the sins and crimes that were committed at the time that the law was active with the priests and the, you know, the tabernacle and the temple, all that, that's the same today. Nothing changes. And I'm going to prove that to you right now. So look at Leviticus chapter number 20. I believe it's verse number 10. Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 10. This is where you see a lot of the, uh, the death penalties are, are spoken of here. <laughs> Capital punishment is what that's referred to as. Look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 10. It says this, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, so that's the man and the woman that did this act, that committed adultery, shall surely be put to death. So what was the punishment for someone committing adultery under the Levitical law? What was it? It's the death penalty, right? Well, a lot of people say, well, you know, the, it, punishments change. But notice, here with Abimelech and Abraham, Moses is the one that gave the law, the Bible says, and he's a descendant hundreds of years later at, from the loins of Abraham. So the law has not been given yet is the point. And guess what? God says that Abimelech was worthy of for committing adultery hundreds of years before the law was given. What? Death. death. Thou art a dead man. Why? Because he, well, he was going to commit adultery with another man's wife. You know what? He shall surely be put to death. That doesn't only apply to a certain period of time. That's God's law, and God's law is perfect. Amen. It is a very wicked, wicked act to commit adultery. It's very right. evil. What Abimelech you know, was going to do here, of course, he's ignorant. We're going to read about that in a minute. That's very, very wicked. Now, whether or not it's, it's accepted today, and this is really what happens. When, it, when a society gets to the point where a sin becomes prevalent, people soften up on it because they see it everywhere and they become desensitized to it. And that's what happens. So because there are a bunch of people that have committed adultery, because there are a bunch of adulterers walking around in our nation today, and you know people that committed adultery, you have family members that committed adultery, friends that committed adultery. When I say adulterers shall be put to death, you think in your mind, well, I know this person that committed adultery. I know that person that committed adultery. And you're just swarmed with this all the time. It's in the news or it's on uh, TV shows and stuff where they try to make it out to be not that big of a deal to get you desensitized to these things. But that doesn't change anything. At the time of Abimelech, he would have deserved to be put to death. At the time of Moses, he deserved to be put to death. And then here's the point. When I spoke about Genesis 19 and Sodom and Gomorrah, I mentioned the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. She deserved to be put to death. Right. That was her punishment. But you know what? God, Jesus, showed her mercy. Just like he showed David mercy when David had committed adultery. But what they deserve, and God shows mercy to whom he will show mercy. Right. He can show mercy to who he wants to show mercy. That's Bible. And no one would argue that David wasn't worthy of death. Everyone would agree with that. Well, it's the same thing with the woman caught in adultery. It's the same thing with the Bimelech. So we have... Before the law, during the law, after the law. God's law never changes. Amen. Never changes. It is the perfect prescription for adulterers, for all of these different subjects. Right. If we want to have, you know, if we want to have a good society, you know, people may not like this, but this is the fact. You want to have a well-behaved society, you need to instill fear into people from committing certain particular crimes. Amen. And that's what God does. That's how, you know how I get my children to behave? They know not to do certain things or I'm to spank them. Right. Now, that's because I love them, but they still, the point is, they know not to do certain things. They know not to go and, you know, you know uh, even though Jeremiah does all of the things I tell them not to do, but my children know not to do certain things. I was going to use an example. I was like, that's a poor example. He does it all the time. He still gets spankings. Yeah, but they know not to do certain things. Of course, when they get older, Michaela's age, she, there's things that she's afraid to do. You know why? Because she'll be scared. You know what? People should be afraid to commit adultery in the United States. People should be afraid to be a sodomite. People should be afraid to do all of these different things, shouldn't they? Right. Why? Because they should be scared of the punishment, Amen. shouldn't they? Amen. And they should be scared of these things. Now you have all these things out in public. At least if people were committing these acts in the past, they were private. They were, you know, the, the homos were in the closet at least. Now they're just flaunting it. 
They don't care. People commit adultery and they laugh about it. They joke about it like it's not a big deal. If it was the death penalty, I bet they wouldn't be doing that. Right. You know what it would do? It would prevent people from going around and, and, and doing these horrific, wicked sins. And that's really what they are. Don't allow you know, our world today, just because they're lascivious and they're just you know so loose in so many areas, to desensitize you to this garbage, it is adultery is a wicked sin. And God came personally to a man's uh, dreams and said to him from the mouth of God, Behold, thou art a dead man. Let that sink in for a few minutes. That's what God thinks about an adulterer. So go back to Genesis chapter number 20. And then it says this in verse number 4. Genesis chapter 20, verse 4. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Now, two things I want to point out, and we're going to kind of segue into a thought here in the next couple verses. It's very interesting. Number one is, notice what he calls him. What? Lord, is he totally ignorant of God, or the God of which will be of Israel later, or the God of Abraham at this time? He's not, is he? He says, Lord, what does he say after that also? Wilt thou slay also a, what? Righteous, righteous nation. Is he ignorant of right and wrong? He's not, is he? Now, has the law been given yet? It has, it has it. Does he say, I can't believe you're going to put me to death over committing adultery? No, he realizes that this would be very wicked. What well, doesn't he? And also, I want you to keep reading there. It says this, verse number five. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Does it sound like he knows that adultery is wrong? He does know that it's wrong, doesn't he? Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter number two. There are a lot of people that are very confused about this thought of you know, what do people do that grow up, you know, in a, uh, in a, in a uh, secluded society? You know, people that grow up maybe in Africa and all these people, they don't know right from wrong. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Everyone knows right from wrong. Everyone knows right from wrong. I want you to look here in Romans chapter number 2. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 2, it says this. In Romans 2, in Romans 3, Romans chapter 2 Verse number 13, it says this, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So the point is, just because you know and hear the law, that doesn't make you just. You have to do the law. Verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, I want you to notice that. Do these people have the law? They had the law given to them? They haven't, have they? This is a perfect example of Abimelech. It says, for the Gentile, for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. You know what that's explaining? It's explaining that Gentile countries, countries that were not of the, specifically ethnically of Israel, that were not given the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the whole law of God, it says that by nature they do those things contained in the law. Just naturally, they do the things contained in the law. All the things that the law contains, they'll just naturally do a lot of those things, won't they? Look at verse number 15. It shows you. It tells you why. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So, them, what, the, what's this say, what this is saying is they're, show, <clears throat> excuse me, they're showing the work of the law written in their hearts by their actions. They're, they're showing or proving that the law is written in their hearts by the fact that they are by nature doing the things contained in the law. That tells you that by nature they are born with the law and it tells you written in their hearts. It says this, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So this is an example of someone who is a Gentile, who has not been given the law. But what does it say? They know the law anyways, don't they? They already know the law. And on top of having the law, every man being born naturally with the knowledge of the law and being written upon your heart, you have your conscience also on top of that bearing witness. And what does it say? Their thoughts, the meanwhile, else excusing or accusing or else excusing one another. What does that mean? One person will accuse another person or a person will excuse them maybe themselves and say, hey, what was the mental like doing? What was he trying to do? 
He was excusing himself, wasn't he? He said, what that means is to say, the opposite of an accusation, to say, hey, I'm not guilty in this situation. You know what that proves? You know what he had in his heart? The law written in his heart. You know what he knew? Adultery is sinful. God wrote the law upon every man's heart. And not only that, you have a conscience that bears witness to that. This man had been like lived many years prior to the law being given, and he's well aware of righteousness. He's well aware of the Lord even. He's well aware of sin, adultery, all of these things. And what is he doing? He's trying to excuse himself, isn't he? He's trying to explain, hey, I'm not guilty, because he knows this is wrong. This is sinful. Everyone knows this. That's why you look around at all nations today. There are things that, all, whether, whether or not they start to become acceptable, if you go back in the history of all nations, basically every nation at some point has, or society, civilization, whatever you want to refer to it as, they have very close to the same moral standards. Theft is wrong. All these things are wrong. They'll at least say, well, we can't steal from each other. They'll at least say that. You know, even uh, the Native Americans, when people say, oh, they, obviously they weren't, you know, because evolution's a fraud, but they, you know, they didn't just pop up out of the ground over here, and people popped up out of the ground on the other side, and, 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 and evolu evolution is ridiculous. But the Native Americans weren't here near as long as people say they were, but they were here for, obviously, quite a while to be settled and to travel around and everything. And they were well aware of, if you look up their history and the things about them, they were well aware. They had their own moral standards. And you know they were very similar to the things of the Bible. They're very similar to the law that was given of not stealing, not committing adultery. Now, of course, people, may, they may move away from these things. But you can look into their, uh, uh, their uh, um, civilizations, if you will, and you'll see that they had things like this at one point. But they believe even when they would go in and steal things, they would do it at nighttime. They knew this stuff was wrong. Why? Because it's written in their heart. Every Gentile has the law written in their heart. Every person, every man has the law written in their heart. So you have no excuse. You end up having no excuse to God. Just like Abimelech here, actually, he ended up being not guilty. He was not guilty in this situation. So it says, let's begin, let's uh, finish reading there, verse 5, one more time. Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even, she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Verse 6. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is uh, another thing that people kind of have a, a, a wrong idea about. And that is, uh, if someone, let, let, I'll give you an example, it's probably the most common example. People about lying, when it comes to the subject of, of lying, people will try to excuse a specific type of lie. And this is still a lie, according to the Bible. Sin is sin no matter what. But they will excuse the lie of ignorance. Now, let me give you a bit of advice. Don't go around repeating things as fact if you are not sure that they are true. Because what is the opposite of, of something being true? If I didn't tell you the truth, I told you what? A lie. Now, whether or not I'm aware of that means nothing. You know, it'd be, that would be an easy way out if I just wanted to go around just telling people and not checking my facts. I could just go around and tell a bunch of lies, couldn't I? So, there's something in the Bible that is called sinning in ignorance. Now, I want you to notice that Abimelech in this situation was totally ignorant, wasn't he? He had no idea. He, and the Bible even says, God confirms his story. And he says, yes, I know that in the integrity of thine heart and the innocent, innocency of thine hands that you are going to do this. That's why I withheld you from what? Sinning against me. So what does that, you know what that means? Even though he was ignorant that that she was married, even though that Abimelech was unaware. Jeremiah, go back there now with mommy. Right now. Hurry up. Like I told you guys. Even though Abimelech was ignorant about Sarah being married, and he thought that she was a, she was just a uh, you know just a single woman. If he would have slept with her, you know, if he would have had this relationship with her, do you know what he would have done? He would have committed, exactly, he would have committed adultery. 
That's the exact same concept of, of, of telling a lie and not knowing it. It's the same thing. You can't have just this exception over here. But people love to make the exception about when people lie and they maybe think that it's the truth. That's why you're sure when you repeat something, or if you repeat something to someone, and you're just like, I think that this is the truth. I'm not positive, but this is you know what I think he said or something. At least you know, at least you can put just a, a clause on there or something at the end just to explain that you're not positive about this, but this is a possibility of what's maybe someone. You understand what I'm saying? So the point is that just because you're not aware that something is, is right or wrong in a specific circumstance, that does not excuse you. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter number 4. I just written down here, Leviticus chapter number 4. The Bible actually talks about in the law sinning in ignorance or sinning through ignorance, the Bible says. Go look at Leviticus chapter number 4 verse number 1. It says, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance. Now, what does the word ignorance mean? It just means that you don't know something. That's all that that means. It, you know, when someone is ignorant, that does not mean that they are, you know, uh, that they're just a dumb person just in general, that they're just stupid. It means that they're just unaware of this. If you just say that someone is ignorant about this, you're saying, well, they just didn't know about that, right? So it just means not to know something. So this person is sinning through ignorance, saying they're not aware that they're sinning. But keep reading. Sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord. Notice that word against. Against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done. You see that? Things which ought not to be done. So should these things be practiced? They should not. These things ought not to be done. Notice there's no exception. And they're still sinning through ignorance against the Lord. And then it says, And shall do against any of them, verse 3, If the priest that is anointed to do sin according to the sin of the people, um, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullet without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Notice what that said? His sin, which he hath sinned. Look at verse... Uh, Verse 4, I think it actually starts to change subjects here. That actually changed subjects there in verse 3. I got the wrong chapter. But it, it, the point is, there's actually uh, uh, there's another location in the book of Leviticus where when someone sins through ignorance, that they actually have a sacrifice, that they sacrifice for the sin of ignorance. That's exactly the same as every other sin. You know what that means? That that was a sin against God. And that, that is a point that shows you specifically that... In that case, and this was, of course, figurative with the, the, the blood of the lamb and the animals and everything, but that blood was required for that sin. You know what that means? That that sin would send you to hell. That's what that means. Right. Because that is figurative of needing Jesus' blood to cover that sin. Yeah. So even if you're not aware of something, even if you maybe have not been, you know, uh, uh, you, like in this situation, you didn't, he didn't know... That she was married, he still would have committed adultery. He still would have been worthy of death. That's not an excuse. Right. You know, so go back to Genesis chapter number 20. So you, that means that you need to be very careful. That means you need to study God's law. Because you know what can happen? We do have the, the, the law, uh, God's law written in our hearts. You know what can happen? Society, like we were just talking about, and culture can try to confuse you. That's what they can try to do. That's the devil is what that is. Trying to con con confuse you and convince you that things that are wrong are all right. So you know what you need to do is you need to go to the Bible and you better make sure that you know what's right and you know what's wrong. Because that's not an excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse according to the Bible. God does not give you just a free ticket out just because you are, are ignorant maybe of God's law or that you're going to sin in a specific situation. Another thing that's interesting is in light of Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed in the chapter prior. And I mentioned the point of why God did not send a preacher to Sodom, but he sent a preacher to Nineveh. You know, and of course he talks about right before that, God clarifies with Abraham when they're having the discussion. God says, you know, or Abraham says to God that he should not the judge of all the earth do right. He said, will you slay, you know, uh, 50 righteous in the city, or 45, and he goes down to the list telling us there's none righteous, number one. So we know there's no righteous in the city besides Lot. He was taken out because Abraham made intercession for him. But let me say this. There's been a lot of people that have, that have tried to you know, use the verse where it talks about that if, that if Jesus, 
If the signs, the miracles, the wonders, I don't have it memorized, would have been done in, where is it, Capernaum in that case? Or is it Bethsaida? I think it's Capernaum. I think it's Capernaum. Capernaum, if it would have been done in thee, thou would have have, they would have remained until this day. Well, there's a couple of explanations that I've heard people give for this particular, for this answer. But let me say this. Look at it in light of number one, chapter number 20. I'll give you the two explanations in just a moment. But I want you to look at it in light of chapter number 20 of what happened with Abimelech here. Notice that God, because God knew in this situation that Abimelech did this in the innocency of his heart and that he would have when God told him, because he's being right, he is being righteous in this situation, that he would have given her back, what did God do with this particular situation? He came to him and explained it to him, didn't he? And what happened? And Abimelech ends up giving back his wife, doesn't he? Now, do you know what, how that would, you know how, how you know, that, that reasons out if you have all these people that were supposedly in this situation, you know, uh, believed on the Lord or repented in Sodom? Number one, you have God not being righteous in light of Genesis 18 because he said there's no one there and that's why I'm destroying the city. Number one. Number two, you have him being a respecter of persons in the situation with Abimelech. And comparing that here to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because he, if he would have known that someone in Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented, why would he have given Abimelech this opportunity right here, which he still would have sinned, even though he didn't know it or not? Why would he have given Abimelech this opportunity and not went there for the person in Sodom that would have repented or would have stepped out of this if they would have done that in their, in their, with their opportunity, Right? Here are the two different explanations. Number one is that that could be referring to Sodom and Gomorrah at a prior time. The Sodom and Gomorrah didn't just appear on the map. They're, they're also spoken of when they're battling and when Lot goes down earlier on, which is quite a few years before that, the king goes and what does he do? He meets there with Abraham. And he has a discussion with Abraham. And you can see that this man is a wicked man even at that time. That could have been one of his opportunities. So this could have been talking about Sodom and Gomorrah at a prior time. But I'll tell you, uh, Brother Josh and I were talking about this the other day, and every time I read that story, Jesus says things sometimes, and this is just a fact, whether you like this or not, Jesus says things sometimes for effect. He says things to get a point across, and we'll do this today even. And what's the most wicked city that's ever existed? Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody agrees with that, right? So you know what he's saying? He's trying to tell them how, how wicked they are. He's trying to stress to them how just uh, preposterous it is that they're not repenting and how low they are. So he uses just an example that's, that's farther than they can even reach to. That's the point. That he's using an example of Sodom and Gomorrah that's just the most wicked possible city just to say they would have repented and look at you. That's his point. That's, when I read that, I think that's obvious that he's trying to just emphasize by using Sodom and Gomorrah in this particular situation. But here's the thing. Yeah, the other interpretation could be perfectly acceptable as well. I don't know which one it is. It doesn't tell you exactly. But here's the point. Shall not the, sh think about this. What did Abraham say to him? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? How unfair would that be? If they would have repented... And God chose not to send a preacher there? Think about that. So that makes me think that he is being facetious, number one. Or number two, maybe he's talking about a prior time in Sodom and Gomorrah's history while they were becoming so wicked. They obviously became a huge city at one point, And they're mentioned prior to that. But everybody always focuses on Genesis 19. That's when they just think that, that Sodom and Gomorrah is there. So it could have been one or the other. But shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Amen. That wouldn't be fair of God to do that. And we know that God is a just God. Amen. God is not, he's not an unjust God. He wouldn't have said, made a statement like that. And there's all these people burning in hell that were in Sodom and Gomorrah. And that if he would have went and done that, they would have repented. Come on. That's ridiculous. Right. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. Amen. Look at verse number seven. It says this, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. 
And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that are thine. There's a lot we can learn. There's so many, there's, there's a lot in this chapter specifically. First thing, it says here we can see that Abraham is actually referred to as a prophet. The reason being is because he speaks the word of the Lord. He talks to God. He has messages from God that he'll speak to other people. Then this also, notice how God, he likes to use man for his will. Notice he says, in order for Abimelech to have this opportunity, that Abraham is going to pray for him. Abraham, in this, these couple of chapters, it's very interesting that he encountered uh, Melchizedek. Who, of course, we know is Jesus, right? An Old Testament appearance of Jesus, who is the priest, and Melchizedek emphasizing the priesthood of Jesus. Well, Abraham is, is, uh, is a figure in these few chapters, these couple of chapters here, of Jesus, I believe, as the priest. Because you know what he did in the last chapter? It tells you that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the uh, destruction, I think it says, out of the midst of the overthrow. Out of the midst of the overthrow. You know what he's doing? He's saying because of the intercession that Abraham made for Lot, this is what happened. Do you know what's going on here? He's telling Abimelech, hey, let him pray for you. What's that sound like? <coughs> Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like the situation with our high priest? That we pray through the name of Jesus. We pray through, you know, uh, God as a man. Right. So this is a very interesting picture how Abimelech, how God tells Abimelech, hey, in this case, you need to go to him. What does Jesus say? You want to go to the Father, you've got to come through me. Right? Perfect situation, or perfect parallel here. We see that with this. It says, he shall pray for thee, and he says, and thou shalt live. It's a very good picture of our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. It also shows the power of prayer. Through this prayer, he can save this man's life. That's pretty drastic. That's pretty powerful. And then he goes on, and if thou, if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. You remember what Leviticus 20.10 said? Shall surely be put to death. That's how it ends. That's how every time he uh, prescribes the death penalty, shall the, the book of Leviticus will say, surely be put to death. And so surely die. Thou and all that are thine. Notice all that are thine. You affect other people with your sin as well. You'd be killing his, by this stupid decision that he could have made. He would have affected his entire family. And there's many examples of this taking place uh, all throughout the Bible. Achan is the perfect example. Look at verse number 8. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, you see he fears the Lord, and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And then it says, and the men were sore afraid. So that's the right reaction. There's many times when people will hear the word of the Lord and the warnings, and they'll mock, they'll laugh. These men have the right reaction. This is the way that our hearts should be. When we hear the word of the Lord and a warning, we should fear the Lord. Amen. Look at verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, what, what hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom? It says this, a great sin. Two things you want to learn from that further is, number one, Abimelech knows of sin, obviously. He's talking about righteousness, all of that earlier. He knows of sin. He knows of the Lord. He knows of right and wrong. He knows adultery is wrong. Not only that, this further proves that sin is not all equal. He says a great sin. You know what that means? One sin is bigger than another. Right. So there's no way for all sin to be equal if there's great sin. There's a sin unto death. There's a sin that's not unto death. Right. Jesus, when he's brought before Pilate, he says that they that had delivered me unto thee have committed the greater sin. Saying the Jews were had a worse punished or were going to have a had a uh, they committed a worse sin than Pilate would have when he you know ended up committing him to death. Right? Then you also have uh, the Bible. Ta Jesus talks about a greater damnation. So. That's, of course, you know, if we look in the Bible, of course, we see that there are different prescriptions for different punishments. Not everything is capital punishment. Why? Because not all sin is equal, right? Uh, we have Moses, when he comes down off the mount, he says to Aaron, when he sees that he made the, the, the molten calf, he says, why have you brought so great a sin upon this people? You know, you think he would have said that if he would have done something like stolen a pencil? Why would you, you know... You know, brought so great a sin upon his people. That's ridiculous. You know why he said that? Because what they did was very bad. It wasn't just bad, it was very bad. Because the, some, not all sins is, is equal. Some sins are worse than others. <clears throat> a lot of times when people try to say that, it's always when you call out a very bad sin. 
So like, yeah, you know, all sins equal. That's when they like to say, you oh, know, all sins equal, you know, because when they're committing adultery, they're doing something like that. Those people wish that all sins equal because they've done something horribly bad and they want it to not be real bad. Just it's not that bad. That's ridiculous. Look at verse number ten. It says this: and Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought. Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Now, this is a fear that Abraham had. It's not just Gerar. It's not just Abimelech. He did the same thing when he went to Egypt. So he, he obviously is a fear that he had. Maybe something happened to Abraham. You know, I have no idea. But he, he did this one other time, so it's not just he comes there and that's what's going on. Look at verse number 12. And yet, indeed, she is my sister... She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So this is his half-sister. Now, does that make it any better, what Abraham did? No. It makes him from North Carolina. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what it does is, yeah, it took her like a couple seconds there. What it does is, yeah. What it does is, is it just shows that his, his heart was still, the intents of his heart was still deceitful. I'm from Kentucky, so now that I get to preach behind the fault, that I can say that all the time. So it's my opportunity, because I've heard it tons of times. But what it does is it shows the intents of his heart. That's what it does. And it shows that whether or not, you know, yes, well, she, you know, she is my sister, and uh, she is, you know, I, yeah, she is my wife, but she's also my sister. What was, what, why did he say it? What was the intent? What was his purpose to deceive, wasn't it? So it's obviously not right. His purpose was to get Abimelech to believe something that was not true. It's not okay. Now, the Bible talks about how when you're reading the Bible, actually, in Hebrews 4.12, it says that it reads you, basically. I've heard people say that in that exact... Uh, 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 the way that it's quoted is it says that it, it knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The thoughts and the intents of the heart. The intents of the heart are also important. You know, the, your intents also matter to God. So you, need, you need to have the right intentions. So don't, don't go down this, you know, this hall where just the intent, intentions matter. Because some people try to do that when they're doing wrong things. They'll say, well, at least his intentions. No. You know, you need to do that which is right. But you also need to have the right intent in your heart. You need to have the right intentions when you're doing things. Look at verse number uh, 13. <clears throat> and it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. Notice this. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. So that kind of contradicts his, further, his previous story, doesn't it? Where he says, Well, I knew the fear of God was not in his place, but he had already told her, it says, when they left their father's house. That was a long, long time ago. His dad died, and Tara died a long time ago. He told her then that at every place whither we, we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. Now, what, what was um, Sarah doing when she was telling people, hey, he's my brother? She was lying, wasn't she? She was intentionally trying to deceive people, wasn't she? Now, who told her to do that? Her husband did. Now, are women supposed to be obedient to their husbands? They are, aren't they? But you know, the Bible tells you clearly in the New Testament, the apostles, they're told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, right? Stop preaching the gospel is what they're told. When Jesus, just prior to that, just weeks, months, how very short time period, told them, go to preach the gospel. Now, who should they listen to? Jesus who said, go preach the gospel, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees who said, don't preach the gospel? They should, pre they should, exactly, they should have preached the gospel and they should have listened to Jesus, right? Amen. The Bible says that, it, that we should, uh, and they, when they respond to him, they say we ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. And that's what you should do, all the women, if your husband tries to tell you to disobey the law of God, you should obey God rather than man. You, we, you should never try to cause controversy with your husband or anything like that, but you should obey the law of God. That should be number one. That, you know, in your, that, there should be no question to that. Right. You obey God rather than man, no matter who the man is. Yeah. So she shouldn't have done this. And she should have, of course, been respectful to, to Abraham, and she should have said, I'm not going to do that. 
because I'm, I, you know, it means more to me that I don't sin against God rather than sin against you. That's what she should have said to him. Look at verse number 14. It says, And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him, Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. It says this, Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So this is an interesting statement right here. It's an interesting scenario in and of itself, the fact that Abimelech, this man who you kind of, you do expect, so you can kind of see why Abraham had that idea that the fear of God is not in this place, who we think of to be a heathen king. But he obviously has the fear of the Lord, and that's our, and that's the way that I have always viewed it. But it's obviously incorrect. When you read the passage, you read the chapter, what's mentioned about him. You know, normally the other nations outside of Israel, Abraham, they're normally heathens, aren't they? Well, in this case, it's very clear that Abimelech fears the Lord, and all the people that are there fears the Lord. And he's aware of God. He's aware of the laws and the commandments of God. He's trying to keep the commandments and the laws of God, isn't he? Well, you have him actually reproving, which is a, it's, it's just a light correction, Sarah. And that's interesting to me because he's not being a hypocrite. He would not have done this. And it's almost like Sarah about got him to do, almost got him to do something that would have been sinful. So you got to see this coming from, from you know, uh, his perspective, Abimelech's perspective. Why is he reproving her? Number one, this isn't something he would do in the first place. He really feels that this is wrong. He said this was in the innocency of his hands. So it would have been wrong for her to do this, wouldn't it? So he's actually correcting her, not in a hypocritical manner, but telling her this is not something that you should be doing. And what's he talking about specifically? He, he, he said that your husband is supposed to be a covering to your eyes. What does he mean by that? He means that, you know, and he says, uh, covering, well, let's read it real quick. I'll explain it further with the next statement. It says, Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Saying, everyone and even the men that are with him, your husband should be covering. Basically, he should be in between like you're looking at him and not all the other people. That's what that's saying. That he's covering your eyes, and you see him, and not everybody else, and not you're not looking at that. You, you shouldn't be able to get by him. Basically, think of it in that way. He's covering you, or he's keeping you, you know, uh, um, righteous, if you will. It's somewhat of a, it's, it's, it's obviously a um, kind of, he's, he's speaking of it in like a poetic, a parable way. It's kind of hard to put into words. Um, but of course, it's, it's obvious what he's telling you. You, know, you shouldn't be going around and looking at all these other men. Your husband should be the one that your eyes, in front of your eyes, your husband should be there. He should be covering your eyes and you're not going to these other men. That's the point, right? So Abimelech is having to correct Sarah. Doesn't this seem kind of odd in this kind of situation? King of Gerar, in this kind of situation, it does, doesn't it? Right, so what, you, what we learn from this is we see, what we, in the book of Genesis, we see a lot of uh, you know, men that we know are righteous men, righteous family, right? Know uh, these people, right? You know what you see? You see just about every one of them have, making major mistakes. Yeah. Noah gets drunk in. You have Lot. I mean, goodness sakes, don't get me started with that guy. You got uh, uh, somebody give me another one. I'm, I'm, I can't think right now. I'm blanking. I'm running on very little sleep. Just some people in the book of Genesis we've read about that have major mistakes thus far. Noah. Noah, the drunken, Abraham. Abraham's done a couple of big mistakes, hasn't he? A lot. Jacob. Anybody else? Jacob. Yeah, Adam. Jacob does. Yeah, we can name a later. Adam, of course, Adam. And, and Eve. I mean, everybody. Every single, basically every person that's mentioned, you may you see them having a big downfall, don't you? It's, you know what you learn from it? I've mentioned this so many times, but it's so important for self-knowledge. It's so important to know who you are and what you're capable of. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's not just, that's not just the, the, a wicked person's heart. It says the heart. It's talking about your heart. Yeah. Everybody's capable of these things. Everybody's capable of falling into sins and, and all of these things that are mentioned here. You know, all the sins, Abraham, Noah, all these things. You know, a Christian's not beyond going out and getting drunk. You know, it's, so when we read about these things that these, that 
the, the downfalls of great Christians that we can read about all throughout the Bible, don't feel like you're, you know, you're just immune to these things. You could do the exact same thing. You know what they are? They're human beings just like you. They're doing the things that you're the same things that you're capable of as well. Look at uh, verse number 17. It says, So Abraham prayed to God, prayed unto God, and it says this, And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. I, when I read that, it's just a perfect picture of Jesus Christ being our mediator or being our intercessor. Amen. How we pray to God. And, you know, like the Bible talks about Jesus making intercessor, intercessory for us. What was Abraham doing here? He's making intercessory for Abimelech. It's just a perfect picture of, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. <clears throat> it says, in, uh, and they bear children, verse 18, for the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, I want, to know, I want you to notice, what's the curse here in this situation? They weren't, what was it? They weren't able to, yeah, exactly, they were barren. They weren't able to have children, were they? They weren't able to bring forth children. All of them in, in, the, the, uh, in the house of Abimelech. So you're going to see all throughout the Bible, the book of Genesis, having children is, what's the opposite of a curse? A blessing. So if the curse was that none of his family was, all of them weren't allowed to have children, what happened after that? They were blessed. Right? It's the opposite of it. They're blessed and they were able to have children. So having children is a blessing. People will look at you like you're crazy. Uh, uh, Brother Simon posted this thing. It's hilarious. On um, Brother Simon Walker. Give a shout out to Brother Simon Walker. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he posted this meme on Facebook. I thought about this thing like five times ago. You guys might have saw it. You guys probably shared it too. Somebody else a couple weeks ago. But he uh it's like it's like when people when people are trying to count the amount of kids I have. Did anybody see that? Yes. And when people see my family and trying to count how many kids I have it's got some lady like like looking like that. Kids are a blessing. And how do people act when they see you when you have many children? All the time. I mean I only have four kids and people act like I'm crazy. All the time at work constantly. If somebody's like how many kids you got? Like four kids? I'm like, goodness sakes, man. Like, that's not even that many kids. What is, what, you know, what is wrong with you? You know? Kids are a blessing. Kids are a blessing. You should have as many as you possibly yeah. can. As yeah. many as you can. Yeah. That's how, that, you know how many kids you should have? However many God gives you. Yeah. You know why? Because just like here, God's the one that closes the womb and God's the one that opens the womb. And as many kids as you could possibly have, that's how many kids you should have. You should keep having them and keep having them and keep having them and never stop. It's a blessing. Children are a blessing. And you know, you see, you see people all throughout the Bible, you know, you see, you know, like in the in the book of Psalms, David's constantly talking about the blessing of having children. And having many children. He says, you know, uh, he talks about children round about thy table. There's multiple psalms that talk about, you know, uh, multiple children being a blessing. I want a big family. I want to have as many kids as I can. I love my children. I want more of them. I, I love just, you know, children in general. I want to have as many children as God will give me. And you should have the exact same attitude. Children are not a burden. Children are a blessing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord.